Okay, uh, in the last video we looked at the Drake equation, which really forms the foundation of modern SETI research. Now, uh, I do intend to analyse uh, the more contentious Drake factors uh, in detail, uh, so things like the origin of life, the evolution of intelligence and so on. Uh, we'll look at all that stuff in later videos. But first I think it's worth exploring an objection that some philosophers and scientists have raised to the whole SETI enterprise. Uh, some people have argued that SETI is not properly scientific, uh, perhaps that SETI is a, a pseudoscience. Even many people sympathetic to SETI question its scientific status. Massimo Pigliucci, for example, says that SETI falls in a grey area. It's worth pursuing and it's not as bad as things like creationism or climate denialism, but it's also not a, a genuine, proper, mature scientific enterprise like evolutionary biology or condensed matter physics or whatever. Uh, so I think, first of all, there are two questions which arise here. First, is SETI scientific? And second, if not, is that a problem? Does it matter if SETI is, is not scientific? Uh, and I think we can deal with the second question quite quickly. Uh, does it matter if SETI is scientific? Well, surely not. Um, there are plenty of non-scientific activities that are still worth doing. Art, ethics, sex, cooking, childcare, car manufacturing, road traffic control, trial by jury. Uh, those are not scientific, but they're still worthwhile. Uh, more pertinently, exploration of the world may not, strictly speaking, be a science. Presumably somebody like Columbus wasn't a scientist, but it's still worthwhile exploring the world. Uh, it helps to increase our knowledge, and that's analogous to work done by SETI. We might think of SETI more as a form of exploration than a science, but it's none the worse for that. Uh, it's really hard to see how there could be anything wrong with simply searching the universe, which is what SETI does. So even if SETI isn't scientific, um, doesn't follow there's anything wrong with SETI. Still, it's an interesting question. Is SETI a science? Well, in order to evaluate the scientific status of SETI, we would first need to ask, what is science? What makes a particular institution or practice scientific? It would take a whole series to deal with that question, and in fact, I already have a series on it. Uh, you can go and check out my Philosophy of Science series if you're interested. So uh, we can't really answer that question here, but we can consider features that are widely considered to be characteristic of science and ask whether SETI exemplifies such features. The main criticism of SETI draws on Popper's idea of falsificationism. I have a video on falsificationism, which you can go and watch if you want more detail. The basic idea is that what distinguishes science from non-science is that scientific theories are falsifiable. Science, scientists will try to acquire evidence to show that their theories are false. The key aspect of science uh, is running experiments and making observations so as to test your theories. But a genuine test requires that it's possible to fail the test. So when you test a theory, there must be some conceivable outcome that, if it happened, would show that the theory was wrong. For example, take general relativity. This theory made some very surprising predictions, like the degree of light bending around the sun, or gravitational time dilation. It's a great triumph of general relativity that all of these surprising predictions were confirmed. But for Popper, what's really important is not so much that the predictions were confirmed, but that in making these predictions, the theory took a big risk. We might have run the experiments and found that there was no light bending, or that there was no gravitational time dilation, and this would have falsified general relativity. It would have shown that general relativity was false. So it's this risk taking, it's, it's, it's opening your theory up to refutation, that's what makes it scientific. The fact that it is open to refutation by the evidence. So science develops through the proposal of uh, bold hypotheses followed by attempted refutation. You come up with a theory that is striking and original and then you do everything you can to show that this theory is wrong. Scientists should be constantly critical, constantly trying to uncover any problems in their theories. Now many philosophers object to the precise details of Popper's philosophy of science, but this basic idea that all science is in principle falsifiable, that it's open to refutation, that has been very influential. And the objection then is that SETI is unfalsifiable. SETI researchers 
expect to discover signals from extraterrestrials. They continually fail to do so. And they say, well, just, just keep looking. Just look a little further. We haven't searched enough. As we saw in the first video, it was once believed that intelligent civilizations were prevalent throughout the universe. The developments over the 19th and 20th century have been a series of basically unrelenting failures for the hypothesis of extraterrestrial intelligence. But none of this was taken to falsify the hypothesis. Instead, the attitude was that, well, if we just look a little further, then we might hit gold. If intelligent life doesn't exist on the moon, perhaps it exists on Mars. If it's not intelligent life, maybe it's merely vegetative life. If life doesn't exist on Mars, maybe one on, on the outer planets. If not on the outer planets, maybe elsewhere in the galaxy. Similarly, if we don't detect, detect signals in wave band X from location Y, then some other location, some other wave band may bear fruit. Evidently, this situation can continue indefinitely. Uh, Edward Regis, in his article, SETI Debunked, sums up the problem. He says, and I quote, no matter how extensive and complete a search may be, the possibility would always remain that it was not complete enough, that maybe we had not searched the right places at the right times, or on the right frequencies, or with the right reception media. There are countless things we might have missed or even failed to look for. Gravity waves, tachyon messages, neutrino oscillations, and so on and so forth. So SETI, uh, so SETI is unfalsifiable and therefore not really a science. Now, the main problem with this line of argument is that falsifiability is a property of specific statements or beliefs or theories. Uh, the statement, there is an elephant in my room, is falsifiable. Just look in the room and yeah, if you don't see an elephant in there, it's been falsified. On the other hand, if you think of a statement like, there is an invisible, intangible unicorn in my room, that's not falsifiable. Um, because the, unif the unicorn is, by hypothesis, undetectable. No observation I make could show that it isn't there. But the point is that SETI is not a statement or a belief or a theory. It's, uh, it's an institution undertaking a search. Uh, I mean, it's just an obvious category error to talk about the falsifiability uh, of a institution undertaking a search. It's really just a bizarre thing to, to even ask about. You know, searching for a unicorn, right? Searching for a unicorn might be a silly thing to do, but it's neither falsifiable nor unfalsifiable, right? Hypotheses about unicorns can be falsifiable or unfalsifiable, but the search can't be. So uh, the objector then might refine her objection and say, well, okay, it's not that searching for extraterrestrials is unfalsifiable, rather the statements, beliefs, or theories of the people engaged in this search are unfalsifiable. Uh, the idea is that, that SETI researchers are motivated by beliefs and theories that can't be falsified. So as currently practiced, SETI is unscientific. I would say that even this weaker objection doesn't hit the mark because when we look at the history of SETI, we find that specific claims about extraterrestrials are straightforwardly falsifiable and in fact have been falsified. Herschel suggested that life uh, existed on the moon. We now know that's false. Uh, in the early years of SETI, before the search really took off in earnest, some scientists thought that the universe might be awash with signals from extraterrestrial life. Some proposed that advanced civilizations will have set up beacons throughout the galaxy broadcasting to others. These more optimistic claims have been falsified. The galaxy has clearly not undergone a massive colonization. It's mostly silent. And there are many more exotic proposals that have been tested. So in the early 90s, the astronomer MJ Harris suggested that we could use a gamma ray search to detect antimatter burning in the galaxy. Uh, standard astrophysical theory tells us that there is no bulk antimatter in the galaxy, but perhaps very advanced extraterrestrials could use antimatter as a source of fuel. Antimatter burning would create a specific type of signal in the gamma ray spectrum, discovering uh, such gamma rays could be a sign of alien engineering. Uh, Harris analyzed data from um, gamma ray searches from the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory and he found no such signals. So this, this negative result uh, didn't completely falsify the possibility of antimatter burning, but it put an upper limit on it and further studies could drive that upper limit down further. So, uh, stronger hypotheses about antimatter burning have been falsified. And from this point of view, it looks like SETI is 
a paradigm of falsifiable science. You know, testable hypotheses are proposed, they're falsified by experiment, and then new testable hypotheses are proposed. That's exactly the method that Popper championed. So I, I guess one final way that we might try to make this objection is to say, OK, although specific hypotheses are falsifiable, SETI research is organized around a general proposition that is unfalsifiable, namely the proposition that there exists detectable uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. This is a, a sort of organizing hypothesis, hypothesis for the search. And we can come up with you know, specific versions of this hypothesis, but this, this general organizing hypothesis cannot be falsified. Now, as, as we've seen, um, this very general hypothesis yeah, this can't be falsified by our failure to detect extraterrestrial civilizations because, you know, we can always assume that we weren't looking in the right places at the right times or whatever. Uh, but actually, even if this uh, uh, hypothesis can't be outright falsified, it's worth bearing in mind that we could certainly show that it has a, a, a lower probability of being true. Biological discoveries might give us reason to think that the origin of life is just extraordinarily unlikely, so unlikely that life has almost certainly not arisen elsewhere. If we uh, conduct a very widespread search, if we look at a variety of habitable planets and we find nothing, no life at all, that would suggest that life requires very special circumstances to arise, which would at least challenge hypothesis A. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's not something we expect to happen, but, you know, th th these are outcomes that would at least pose a challenge. And one reason why uh, SETI advocates might still be quite confident uh, is the search has been pretty paltry so far. It's not so much that hypotheses like A are completely untestable, it's just we haven't really done enough to test them. I mean, we haven't even properly examined our own solar system. For all we know, life may well exist underground on Mars, or it may exist in Europa's subsurface oceans or in Titan's methane lakes. In fact, it's even possible that there is a, uh, a sort of, that there was a second genesis of life on Earth, a, a shadow biosphere, as it's called. I've got a video on the, on the shadow biosphere. That seems to remain at least in principle possible. Um, so even our own solar system and even our own planet hasn't been properly searched yet for uh, other forms of life. The galaxy is a very big place. You know, the, the more we search and find nothing, the more likely that A is false. But at present, uh, it seems we haven't really searched enough to pass any judgment on the matter. A second question, though, is, well, does SETI depend on hypothesis A? It's hard to see how. Uh, searching for X doesn't need to assume the existence of X. Indeed, many scientists involved in SETI uh, are skeptical of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. For example, Paul Davies has long been involved in SETI, but um, uh, I seem to recall from reading his book, The Eerie Silence, he says at the end of it that he's inclined to think that we might be the only civilization in the universe. So he's, he's on the more skeptical side, but he's still involved in SETI. Uh, and of course, I suppose there's a you know, more general point here that if the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is just taken for granted anyway, then um, you know, why would you even need to bother with a search, right? Why would the, you know, if, you, if you assume that extraterrestrial intelligence does exist, then uh, it's unclear why the discovery of that intelligence would have any significant scientific or social consequences. So uh, one would think then that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence would depend on the assumption that we just don't yet know, which I think is probably the position that most um, scientists would take. Anyway, even assuming that SETI is organised around uh, hypothesis A, well, if that's a problem, you can just interpret it as uh, being organised around a different proposition that there does not exist detectable uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, this is a bold hypothesis, but it's not outrageous. It has been defended by uh, some serious scientists. 
Uh, and of course, it's also entailed by various hypotheses that are taken seriously by scientists, such as the hypothesis that the origin of life is extremely unlikely, or the hypothesis that intelligence is extremely unlikely to evolve, even in good conditions. Uh, and this hypothesis B is easily falsifiable, uh, or, well, perhaps not easily, but straightforwardly falsifiable. Just find one example of another civilization, and you falsify B and also falsify all of the hypotheses that entail B. So, you know, even if at the moment SETI, research, uh, SETI researchers do assume hypothesis A, it's easy to make it into a legitimate science by just assuming hypothesis B instead. We can treat SETI as the attempt to falsify hypothesis B and all of the hypotheses that would entail hypothesis B. And it's, it's worth keeping this in mind as we go through this series because we're going to see in later videos there are many arguments uh, for the claim that extraterrestrial civilizations must be uh, either extremely rare or perhaps non-existent and so SETI is likely to fail. But from the point of view of falsificationism, these arguments actually lend support to SETI because they allow us to interpret SETI as the attempt to falsify various hypotheses about the prevalence and nature of life and intelligence. So uh, I think that the falsifiability objection is not really a very plausible one. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to pose a serious problem. I think it's quite easily uh, responded to. Now a somewhat different type of objection is that nothing could ever convince us of extraterrestrial intelligence and so SETI is a waste of time or it's unscientific for this reason. Uh, no evidence of the kind that SETI is looking for could actually convince us that extraterrestrial civilizations exist. So, um, so here's a point. Throughout the history of astronomy, strange signals have often prompted the suggestion of extraterrestrial activity and this suggestion has always been wrong. In the early 1900s, Nikola Tesla picked up uh, rhythmic signals on his radio receiver that he believed came from either Mars or Venus. He thought he had detected uh, a series of numbers sent by the aliens, and he attempted to send a message back to open up a line of communication. Obviously, he was wrong. I think that what he actually picked up was ultimately attributed to atmospheric disturbances, but it certainly wasn't aliens. A very famous case in astronomy was Jocelyn Bell's discovery of pulsars. Uh, so at the time, uh, in the late 60s, Jocelyn Bell was a research student involved in research on quasars. Uh, she had to uh, operate the radio telescope and analyse the data. And one day she noticed what she described as a, uh, a bit of scruff in the data, which always came from the same part of the sky. Closer analysis of this scruff revealed that it was actually perfectly timed pulses of 16 milliseconds coming once every uh, 1.3 seconds. So every 1.3 seconds you'd have a 16 millisecond pulse and it was perfectly timed. Now initially this was assumed to be some sort of artificial interference from the Earth because no known natural source could produce a signal like that but uh, further analysis uh, found it to be coming from well beyond the solar system. So, of course, the possibility that it was raised that it might be extraterrestrials. Uh, in fact, uh, they even even wrote on the uh, on on the printout. Um, if you look if you look this up, they they actually write uh, I think little green men or LGM for for little green men. They've uh, raised the possibility that it might be extraterrestrials. Well, no. Uh, numerous other pulsars were discovered, and we now identify them with rapidly spinning neutron stars. Uh, more recently, we had the case of Tabby's star, which exhibited irregular changes in its luminosity, unlike anything that we'd ever seen before. It was suggested that maybe these changes in luminosity could be due to some sort of mega structure orbiting the star, blocking out parts of its light. Uh, there are many other possible explanations, including that it could be due to a swarm of comets or a dust ring, but I think that's still currently unexplained. Uh, anyway, this is a familiar story. We find something unusual and the thought is that it's extraterrestrials. Now, what's the point of all of this? Well, there's a popular fallacy sometimes committed by theists, which is known as the uh, God of the Gaps 
argument. And in this argument, the uh, theist will note some phenomenon that does not yet have a complete scientific explanation, such as consciousness or the origin of life, and then uh, he infers that God must be the cause. So gaps in scientific knowledge are treated as evidence for the existence of God. For example, there is as yet no scientific consensus as to how life first arose on this planet. Various theories have been proposed, but we're, we're nowhere near an answer at this point. Perhaps we'll never get an answer. And the theist assumes, uh, well, not every theist, but some theists assume, well, since the origin of life is not explained scientifically, it must instead be explained by the action of God. I mean, the obvious flaw in this argument is that our inability to find a naturalistic explanation is merely a psychological fact about us. It doesn't entail that some non-naturalistic explanation must be correct instead. Uh, many things that people failed to explain naturalistically in the past were later brought within the fold of science. Now, the, the, the problem here is SETI seems to be in danger of committing a similar fallacy, which we might call the extraterrestrials of the gaps fallacy, where astronomical phenomena not explained in uh, abiotic terms are attributed to the operation of life or intelligence. Now obviously SETI researchers are well aware of this danger and so they adopt the methodological principle that only when all plausible abiotic explanations are ruled out can we assume life or intelligence. And that includes of course ruling out plausible abiotic explanations that we haven't yet conceived of. We don't yet have an abiotic explanation for Tabby's star, but we think there probably is one. And that raises a question of what could ever count as evidence for extraterrestrials? I mean, we're, we're looking for, for signals or for signs of the byproducts of alien activity. What would this, what, what would convincing evidence for extraterrestrials look like? Because even if we don't yet have an abiotic explanation for some phenomenon, it may still be possible to develop one in the future. So, I mean, just to sort of give you an example of the trouble here. Uh, uh, so originally, SETI was focused on the, de on the detection of radio signals that were intentionally sent out by other civilizations desiring to communicate. Um, now, you know, if we received a signal that could be translated into a sophisticated language or something, then I, I guess that would be a sure sign of intelligence. But a lot of people have thought that that would probably not be the best way of, of sending out signals. Um, you know, it's, it would be very difficult, probably perhaps even impossible to, to translate uh, sentences from an alien language. A popular suggestion was that aliens might instead send a signal that contains prime numbers. Uh, one, two, three, five, seven, eleven. So pulses could be sent out where the time between the pulses is a series of primes. You know, so, so I don't know. You might have uh, ten seconds between pulses, and then and then a twenty-second gap, and then a thirty-second gap, and then a fifty-second gap, or whatever. Uh, no known astrophysical processes can produce primeness in this in this way. Uh, and it was also, a lot of people have, have thought that mathematics should, have, should be developed by any advanced civilization. If, you're at, if your civilization is at the point where it is sending radio signals into space, then it's going to have developed mathematics. So mathematics, uh, a lot of people have thought, would be a universal language that could be used in any signal. Um, so a series of prime numbers uh, have been suggested as a, a good, clear sign of an intelligent civilization. Turns out this is perhaps not such, uh, 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 well, not such a clear indicator. Uh, primeness doesn't necessarily indicate intelligence. There are phenomena in nature that produce primeness. For instance, the life cycles of certain species of cicadas uh, follow a prime number of years. The cicadas emerge at intervals of uh, seven, 13, and 17 years, uh, and that's to do with avoiding predation. It's quite interesting. You should look it up uh, if you just type in you know, cicadas, prime number, life cycles in, in Google. You'll uh, be able to read some of the proposed explanations of this uh, interesting phenomenon. Another example of mathematical sequences arising without intelligence is that on many flowers, the number of petals is a Fibonacci number. Anyway, point is, we may not yet know of any 
abiotic astronomical processes that can produce sequences like this. But nature constantly surprises us. You know, can we rule it out? Can we be sure that there's, uh, that there's nothing out there in the universe? No strange types of star or whatever that produce primeness somehow? Um, it's, it's difficult to see how we could ever be in a position to rule that out. So perhaps primeness wouldn't work as an indicator of intelligence. Now these days, uh, the goal of SETI has expanded somewhat. So it seems, well, so a lot of people have argued that it's unlikely that civilizations would send out radio signals, uh, and even if they did, why would they aim it at, at the Earth, right? I mean, we've been sending out detectable signals for less than a century, so unless the aliens are very close, they wouldn't even know we're here. Um, so there's no particular reason to think they would be sending signals to us anyway. So rather than looking for intentional signals, a lot of people are now saying we should look for signals that arise as a byproduct of extraterrestrial activity. A popular proposal is uh, a Dyson sphere. This is a gigantic spherical structure built around a star in order to harvest almost all of the star's energy output. Obviously, being on a single planet, we receive only a tiny fraction of the sun's energy. If we could enclose the sun in some sort of sphere, uh, you'd be able to harvest much more energy from that. Um, and so civilizations that are much more advanced than us would have presumably much greater energy requirements and perhaps the ability to construct some sort of sphere like this to harvest the energy of their stars. Perhaps then we could detect other civilizations by searching for Dyson spheres. How do we detect Dyson spheres? Uh, well, a Dyson sphere would re-radiate energy in the infrared part of the spectrum. So we're looking for sun-like stars which show an excess in the infrared spectrum. And in fact, some candidate stars have been discovered. But obviously, we don't think we've actually found Dyson spheres here because some other process might be responsible for the infrared excess. Short of actually seeing the sphere itself, it's really hard to say what could possibly count as convincing evidence for a Dyson sphere. Yes, we could look for uh, changes in illumination, uh, or we could look for a particular um, you know, infrared excess, or, or we could look for uh, certain chemical signatures in the spectrums of the, of the star. But in all of these cases, I mean, it, how, can you, how can you rule out the possibility of an abiotic explanation? Uh, it's really not obvious how to do that. Uh, another, just a final example of this problem is, uh, well, it has been suggested that we might be able to detect light signals on the night side of an exoplanet, which would possibly indicate civilization. Uh, any aliens with good telescopes looking at the Earth might be able to detect the light from our cities at night. But again, this wouldn't be conclusive because we know that intelligence isn't required for light since many organisms produce bioluminescence. Who's to say that the light at night isn't due to an ocean teeming with bioluminescent plankton? Uh, also, plenty of non-biotic processes produce light, uh, admittedly uh, non on the kind of you know, scale that would light up the night side of a planet. But you know, again, how can you rule it out? So this is a sort of general problem uh, with, with SETI, which I think is perhaps a bit more worrying than the falsifiability objection. It, it's just the question of what could possibly count as convincing evidence? Um, and that's not really so obvious. I mean, of course, if aliens came down in a, in a spaceship and they landed on the, on, on the Earth, then that would be pretty convincing. But when we think about the kind of evidence that SETI is searching for, you know, when we're searching for signals with mathematical properties, or we're searching for uh, byproduct signals that arise as byproducts of, of extraterrestrial activity. In all of these cases, it seems like there would be uh, other explanations, even if we haven't yet conceived of those explanations, you know, we can't rule out the possibility. So that may be uh, uh, a concern to consider. What could convince you? that the aliens are out there. Okay, that's all for now. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.